What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Wednesday, September 4th, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy Newsbeat Stand-Up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, Biden grants first new LNG approval since freezing permits. Wow, talk about a change of direction there. Next up, Saudi Aramco continues to pursue downstream and LNG deals. Next up, Volkswagen ends 87-year streak of German production as it hangs in the balance. Ooh, interesting. Next up, the taxpayer-funded illusion Cheap Renewable Energy, this is a great, great, very long opinion piece by William DeHo over there at Unsplash. Oh, no, wait, that's the author. The author, it's uh, from the Manhattan Contrarian. We love those guys. Yes, we do. Um, Next up, why Kamala Harris will not bring down prices. Her plan needs inflation. Ooh, could have told you that much. We'll do a quick U.S. oil and gas drilling activity update along with showing U.S. oil production slipping. Stool then tossed it over me. I will quickly cover what happened with oil and gas prices. A broader markets and oil had a pretty pretty brutal day today. And then we'll briefly touch on API crude oil inventories. Well, that's really it, guys. So, as always, I'm Michael Tanner, <laughs> joined by Stuart Turley. Where do you want to begin? I'll tell you what, I did not have, Evan. Biden grants first new LNG approval since freezing permits on my bingo card this morning, Michael. So... No, I did not. New Fortress Energy receives a five-year license to sell LNG, but here's where it gets dicey. The climate groups got upset. Holy smokes. They were like, what is going on? The USDOE, Department of Energy, granted a five-year license Tuesday to Wes Eden's company, New Fortress Energy, which is developing small-scale LNG export known as fast LNG onshore near Altamira, Mexico, is key for U.S. LNG. Here's a quote. It's ridiculous that the Department of Energy would issue this license despite the administration's ongoing incomplete public interest review of such exports, said Mitch Jones, a managing director at Food and Water Watch, a progressive environmental group. The department is now under no obligation to approve these ill-advised proposals now or ever. I got a message for you there, Mr. Mitch Jones. You're welcome on the podcast anytime. Let's talk about how much LNG can actually save the planet in CO2 emissions by getting this out there instead of having your expertise in food and water, which is a waiter, I think. I'm not sure. But if you're a waiter and you're an expert in LNG or carbon, please, I want you on this podcast. How's that? I'm sorry. (laughs) a waiter oh well, yes just by reading his bio it was like dude you never graduated college and you're a waiter and you're trying to say do you know how much carbon in the lng markets are saving because they're putting coal plants out of business yeah i mean it's i, I, I couldn't have said it better I, I you know all i'll add to this is that it is kind of crazy to see the biden administration's complete 180 on lng exports you wonder if it had, you know you wonder if it has anything to do with the fact that he's now a lame duck and he's actually, you know, ironically reading the facts or somebody in his administration is reading the facts. I mean, he got to give credit he, where credit's due. I'm going to take it and say, yay. I did have to give him a shout out just because he was a waiter. I was a waiter and I was a great waiter. But when you sit back and take a look at this, Michael, I think that they did approve it only because of the Chevron deference that has been going on. They're having to appeal it. And so they, this was one of those, they just threw it out there to shut people up. Well, hey, hey, the way, credit where credit's due, we'll take this. Let's yeah. talk Saudi. Let's go to Saudi Aramco continues to pursue downstream and LNG deals. Saudi Aramco is actively seeking M&A opportunities in downstream and LNG sectors. Admit aims to expand its international presence, secure additional outlets for its crude oil. 
quote unquote, the downstream business is where we have M&A opportunities and now LNG as well. Yes, Air Mafuri, Aramco's executive vice president for products told Reuters, we have targets and markets. It's pretty important. They entered into discussions with the Helgengi group and regarding the potential acquisition of another 10% in Helgeni Petrochemical. It's pretty cool. No, they're all over the place. Remember, they also did sign that non-binding agreement with Sempra and their Port Arthur LNG project and may or may not acquire another 25% whenever that enters phase two. So super interesting there. I mean, Saudis made it clear they see a lot of growth in the LNG segment and they want to wrap their, I mean, they're, they're true monopoly. They want to wrap themselves off the entire value chain. So, you know, they're going to continue, you know, as they've said, to, to push this and, and continue to wrap up a lot of this downstream. You know, they're, you know, they're, they're doing what they should from a Saudi Aramco standpoint, locking up that entire value chain. And, and they're looking at energy as an entire process from the wellhead to downstream to renewables to hydrogen and that's the way mm-hmm. it should be looked at that's absolutely awful. all right let's let's talk about volkswagen volkswagen 87 year streak of german production hangs in the balance michael yesterday you and i talked about renewable energy and the destruction of an economy and here it is volkswagen is considering closing factories in germany in for the first time in its 87 year due to falling profits and rising costs these rising costs michael are energy costs they are going through the roof the economic environment has become tougher and newer players are pushing into europe the chinese which is absolutely driving them nuts bloomberg noted any shutdowns would mark the first closures in Germany in the first 87-year history, setting VW up for a clash with powerful unions. How are you going to clash with a powerful union when you shut your plant down? Well, hey, it's <laughs> it, it goes to show you that we talked about, a lot about labor yesterday. Labels become, labor's become a huge, huge cost associated with a lot of this stuff. You know, I, I'm always partial to Volkswagen. The first ever car I drove was a Volkswagen Passat. I'll always have love for those vehicles, even if they were a I little do love Volkswagen. Too, even if they were a little too low to the ground. What's interesting is that VW delivers about 20% of their vehicles to China, even amid the broader decline in quote unquote petro powered vehicles. This is not good. You're, you got to have a spokesperson tell Reuters, quote, we do not expect an easy year. Ooh. Ooh, never good when your IR, hey, IR guy of the week right there. Hey, at least well, we're being maybe, honest. Maybe he, maybe he was like, maybe not going to have an, a good year is beautiful language for we're going to take it in the kneecaps. Yeah, maybe. So, maybe. All right, let, what's next? Let's go to the Manhattan here. The taxpayer-funded illusion of cheap renewable energy. I got to hand it out to uh, on X again. I just said, can you create a picture of cheap renewable energy. And I expect to see unicorns and, you know, fairy dust in this picture. It's a pretty cool looking picture. But anyway, let's go on to the story here. Germany, UK, California, and now New Jersey and New York or consumer electric prices are double to triple the U.S. average. But what the difference are, their race to convert wind and solar, here's where the numbers come in important. Later on down in here, it says South Dakota, as is number one, says renewable supply, 95% of the demand, yet the state has ninth lowest energy price. Do duplicity, do publicly available data back that up? No, they don't. Look at Coal's 36%. There's a numbers game problem going on. They've got large hydro there. So on the wind provided 55% of it, and they've got wind. So according to 77 South Dakota generation, not the 95%. They kind of like excluded the coal. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's... Just don't look at... You won't see this coal plant. You don't <laughs> see anything. It's one of the penguins from what, what's that movie? I forget. Oh, the Madagascar. Yes, Madagascar. You don't see anything. It, it's really true. Again, I, I love this quote. The influential academic says renewables alone can halt the climate crisis. Wind, water, and solar can provide 
plentiful, plentiful and cheap power. He argues ending carbon emissions that driving climate crisis. I mean, I mean, some of these people, these people just say things that there's no basis to be able to even make that quote. Exactly. If it, and I think it's because of who they're they're getting paid by. And it's almost like everybody that is out there saying they're climate alarmists are being paid by somebody. They definitely are being paid by somebody. All right, let's talk about our favorite vice president, Kamala Harris. Going to this next story. This one is going to be a quick one. Why Kamala Harris will not bring prices down. Her plan needs inflation. This is a very interesting article from Zero Edge. I love the guys over there at Zero Edge. And this one is first, there's about three bullet points. And let's just go through these. Kamala Harris will do nothing to cut inflation because she wants inflation to disguise the monster deficit and a debt accumulation. In the latest figures, the deficit has soared to $1.5 trillion in the first 10 months of the fiscal year. Public debt has soared to $35 trillion in the administration's own forecast. They will add another $16.3 trillion deficit from 2025 to 2034. I can't afford what's going on now, let alone when we keep on this. No, I mean, it's it's clear. You want to give $25,000 away for new home buyers? Well, guess what? The $300,000 home is now just $325,000. Thank you very much to all the sellers in America. We're just giving them a subsidy for their homes. I mean, it's, again, I don't think a lot of the stuff that she's and, saying. And Oh, no. And, and the sad part if is If I was that- a conspiracy theorist, and I'll, you know, I'm not, but if I was... I would say they're trying to buy votes. But in a conspiracy theorist, if you were a conspiracy theorist, might say that if you're giving that $150,000 on a loan that you don't have to pay back to illegal aliens only, you're importing voters and then bribing them with a $150,000 house. Good thing we're not saying that. It's a good thing we're not saying that. All right, let's go to the next one before I throw up. U.S. oil and gas drilling activity, oil production slip. This is a nice article again from oil price. Oil prices fell on Friday on rumors that OPEC would unwind its production cuts as unplanned beginning in October. And I was surprised to see it, Michael, at the time of us recording was $70.00. For WTI and Brent is 73. Holy smokes. The number of rigs uh, only fell to two to 583. Four years ago, you and I were worried we were going to hit 700. Yeah. Here's the thing. I think a lot of what happened, and we'll talk about oil prices specifically in the finance segment. I think what you're seeing is a pretty structural change. I think this this article also points out the frac count spread, which is basically an estimate of the number of completion crews that are working on wells that haven't been turned online yet, fell from the week that ends August 23rd from 234 down to 229. So the number of, you know, you know, rig crews are slowing down, completion crews are, are are slowing down. But we also saw, according to the EIA, we've surpassed 13.3 million barrels per day on average for a new record. So we continue to beat highs. Rigs continue to drop. It's only it's 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 only a matter, matter of decline show up now on the counterfactual. You know, production at all time high, rigs at a steady state. Maybe that means we're getting more production from each of these wells, which is true. Everyone's moving to the three. We also talk about the infamous four mile lateral, which everybody's talking about specifically in the Bakken. You know, you're seeing a lot of stuff going on in the Uinta basin right now that they, that it is having some pretty incredible results that we've talked about. So I don't want to just quick, I don't want to just jump to the conclusion that we're head, we're, we're headed off a cliff for oil production. We always seem to, to grow it as you know, we'll talk about with prices, Libya, it's all back online now. So a lot of interesting stuff going on, but this is a great breakdown over by Julianne Geiger there on oilprice.com. You betcha. All right. Off to you. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and, and, and cover some oil and gas finance stuff, guys. Before we do that, as always, we got to pay the bills around here. Thank you for checking out energynewsbeat.com. All the, quote, news and analysis you've just heard is brought to you by that website. Stu and the team do a tremendous job making sure it stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy and the oil and gas business. Hit that description below for all the links to the timestamps, links to the articles, and check us out at investinoil.energynewsbeat.com to get access to our exclusive working interest program that we are so happy to be a part of. 
But let's go ahead and jump over here, guys. Overall markets, I mean, took a big swing today. S&P and NASDAQ both down 2 and 3 percentage points, mainly off the back of tech stocks getting slaughtered. Reports out of Bloomberg was that Indivia and other chip makers were received a notice of potential antitrust violations as served Ooh. by the U.S. Department of Justice and, 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 and other, and the FEC, or the F, yeah, the FEC, which is pretty, or not FEC, excuse me, the federal FTC. It's been a long day, folks. It's been a long day. But, you know, that that drove, you know, basically Indivia was down 9% while the trading day was open. They're down another 2% in after hours trading. So a total of 11% absolutely dragged market. It's going to be interesting to see. I don't know how, you know, obviously Indivia, you know, being a U.S.-based company, but they have most of their manufacturing overseas. It's going to be very interesting. You know, Linda Khan, I think she knows that she's out of a job here if Trump wins. So, it's going to be spicy to see what she ends up doing from that standpoint. Let's go ahead and, and, and move on Two and 10 year yields. Absolutely flat dollar index up about a 10th of a percentage point. Bitcoin down two percentage points. Food oil absolutely slaughtered that today down five percentage points. Brent oil about basically down the same percentage points. Natural gas actually saw a nice spike today. We were down below $2.11 all the way up to $2.22. But crude oil, guys, 70 after opening the day, just above $74. Libya coming out and basically saying, oh, we're back, which, again, why that wasn't already priced in was, is kind of crazy. Oil drops down five percentage points, currently trading 70 33 that's right $70 even and 37%. It it's going to be completely interesting to see where things go from here because I just find it interesting that nobody had this already priced in. It's like, well, what did you expect? I mean, what did you expect? Libya was always going to bring their production back online, so the fact that we have to have a $5 swing or a $4 swing because of Libya production, it goes to show you there's something deeper under the hood here. And I go back to what we've been talking about, which is People are embracing and getting ready, and oil is right-sizing itself for Saudi to unwind the cuts. Remember, the oil price is always a, a factor of what is future supply and demand look like, and I think people are speculating that the future supply is going to be a lot more than what they've currently priced in. Saudi is down to turn the taps back on, or, or so they think. So that is where I think the majority of the movement comes, even though if you were to hit up our friends at Reuters, they might tell you that it was uh, Libyan oil coming back along, but I think that is a little bit of a smoke and mirrors. We actually get API yep. crude oil inventory numbers tomorrow, considering Monday was Labor Day, so we get a little reprieve there. We'll make sure to cover all that and a bag of chips tomorrow. But other than that, Stu, pretty pretty chill for me. Nothing else. We're kind of in in the lull. No M and A's. No M and A's to be heard. Nothing. Nothing really crazy. Yeah, I mean, nothing. Nothing nope. really interesting, Stu. Anything else that you think we're missing today? No, nope. I think we're going to have a great day tomorrow, though. It's going to be a short week. Yeah, it's going to be a nice short week. We love it. We'll get you out of here on that, guys. We appreciate you for checking us out here on the World's Greatest Podcast. Again, check us out, www.energynewsbeat.com. For Stuart Turley, I'm Michael Tanner. We'll see you tomorrow, folks.